I am Nanette Wenger. I'm professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiology at the Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. And I've just presented at the International Academy of Cardiology the 2017 annual scientific sessions here in Vancouver, British Columbia. My presentation was entitled Geriatric Cardiology, Octogenarian Pearls. And the purpose of the presentation was to define some of the challenges that cardiologists today have in dealing with their elderly patients. What has happened is that the elderly population worldwide is simply exploding. And the fastest growing component are individuals older than 85 years of age. Now, these individuals have a high occurrence of cardiovascular disease because changes in the body predispose to cardiovascular disease. There's vascular stiffness, there's loss of vasodilation, there's loss of pacemaker cells, a whole variety of features. So that these individuals are at higher risk of cardiovascular disease, they have probably two-thirds to three-fourths of all of the cardiovascular episodes in the hospital. And we have a dearth of evidence-based information to guide their care. In a sense, this very vulnerable population has outlived its database. So what is it that we have to do? The guidelines that we have to treat elderly patients are disease-specific. But elderly patients with cardiovascular disease frequently have two or more other chronic conditions. They often have frailty. They have cognitive limitations. They have functional limitations. So what we have to learn to do is to use patient-centered care rather than disease-centered care. And we have to learn to incorporate the values that our older patients have for their health care. Most of the randomized trials that provide us data for decision-making have endpoints of mortality. Most elderly individuals are less concerned with long-term survival than they are with independence, with functional status, with decrease in symptoms, and with decrease in hospitalizations. And these endpoints don't appear very much in the clinical trials that form our evidence base. And of course, the other feature is that the elderly individuals, even those included in the trials, are not reflected of the elderly population that I see in my office. They have less comorbidities, they're more functional, et cetera. So what is it that we have to do? And essentially, what we have to do is to say, here is the evidence for a disease. Now, how do I apply that to my patient who has not only this disease, but other diseases, and who is much more concerned with function and decrease in symptoms than with improvement in survival. And I gave as an example in my talk the RCRI, the Revised Cardiac Risk Index. And that is what we all use when we evaluate patients for non-cardiac surgery. And you get a certain number of points for hypertension, for diabetes, for coronary disease, for stroke, et cetera. And that's fine but it gives you an incomplete picture because it doesn't address the multimorbidity that our older patients have. It doesn't address frailty. It doesn't address cognitive decline. So we have to put all of this together. And then as we use the evidence base, this is probably the prime area for shared decision-making. Before we decide on a test or a procedure or recommend something to a patient, what we have to do is to say, how does that fit in the total context of the patient, the other illnesses, and the patient's value systems? And this is what we have to decide with the patient. Does the patient want everything done? Because they are the few among the elderly for whom survival is very important. Do they just want an intervention that will keep them independent and functional? 
Obviously, I think all of them will want to improve symptoms and avoid hospitalizations. And it's on that basis that we make the decision with the patient, saying, for example, do you want to take a statin therapy to lower your cholesterol? You probably will get benefit from it. The benefit will appear over the next few years. But we don't have information on 85-year-olds treated with statins. There may be some side effects, but in general, they are less prominent than are the benefits. And then the patient makes the decision and makes the decision whether or not they want this additional medication. And it may be a difference whether it's just the second or third medication or whether it's the seventh or eighth. And then for many of our elderly patients who are at the end stage of the disease, what we have to do is examine everything that we're doing and say, is this all necessary? We have to get in a mode of deprescribing. Say, is this medication necessary? Will the patient do better without it? Because all of the medications in someone taking five or six or seven other medications have the potential for adverse effects and for drug-drug interactions. So what geriatric cardiology truly is, is the practice of cardiology adapted to the needs of the elderly patient who has multimorbidity, who has polypharmacy, who has limitation of physical function, who may have frailty, and who may have cognitive decline. And the discussions have to happen during the time the patient is stable, not when the patient has an acute episode and is in an intensive care unit. So we have to learn to talk with our patients, to see what it is they want from their medical care. And then, as I've said, what is needed between the clinical practice guidelines for disease and the patient is a thoughtful clinician who melds the evidence base, small as it is, with the patient's values and desired outcomes. That, to me, is geriatric cardiology.